first time that you are with us this morning. God bless you uh, for being with us and joining us. We're glad this July the 4th Sunday. Amen. 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 It is 245th birthday of America and God bless America. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. With all of its problems, all of its difficulties, I believe it's still the greatest country in the world because the church God has blessed America. Never forget where your blessings come from. Never forget that. But God bless you. Uh, we invite you to make sure to go and, and like us on Facebook. Share uh, the afternoon sermon will be shared on Facebook in the afternoon. Uh, share that with your friends. That go on YouTube, Facebook, and, and find that and share it with them. Get the word out. Can you say amen to that? Amen. But today is Independence Day. and God bless you for choosing to worship with us this morning on this July the 4th day. And we'll try not to hold you too long, but uh, we just want the liberty of the Lord and God's presence to touch you before you leave here today. Amen. Amen. Praise God this morning. Stand to your feet all over the sanctuary one more time. We're going to open this service up with the Pledge of Allegiance this morning. Amen. Because we know that we are blessed of God. And we honor Him this morning. Praise God if you will this morning. Turn with us this morning. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the United States. 
United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. <laughs> Forgive me for that. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I say the pledge at least once a month. <laughs> At least once a month, it's, you know, praise the Lord. <laughs> you get up in this pulpit up here, and it, it's a whole different world. Amen. Amen. <laughs> praise God. Praise the Lord for this morning. But just worship the Lord. Let the Lord touch you this morning. Our worship team has, has put together this morning songs to honor this nation. And just join in with us this morning as we sing today. Amen. You want them to stand again? Stand to your feet one more time. Come on. Praise God. Amen. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight
things were wrong I worked for all my life And I had to start again With just my children and my wife I thank my Lord and love To be living here today Cause the flag still stands for freedom To the hills of Tennessee, across the plains of Texas, from sea to shallow sea, from Detroit down to Houston, New York to LA. There's blessing and God's grace that we're here today. Yes. If you are active military or former military, I want to ask you to stand up at this time, this morning. Any active or former military, please stand this morning. Come on, give them a hand this morning. God bless you richly today for your service. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Praise God for all his blessings. Yes. Praise the Lord for he has richly blessed this nation. Let us never forget that it's by the hand of God. Never forget it's because of what he has done in and through us. But it takes men and women that are willing to stand up men and women that are willing to fight for the cause. Praise God this morning. Can you say amen to that? Amen. America has always been a nation that has fought for those less fortunate, those that could not defend themselves. And I believe that is what God has instructed us to do. Amen. We'll transition right here in the service this morning to communion service this morning. Communion here, only requirement is that you be a born again child of God. That's not a requirement that this church sets forth, but that God sets forth. And I want to ask you, if you've not already received your sacraments this morning, please, if you will, just slip your hand up and Brother Russ will bring to you. He had some. 
give a moment for everyone to be served. Please don't let anyone be overlooked because God never would overlook anyone. Amen. being a sprinter this morning. <laughs> Anyone else that would like to be served that has not yet been served? Thank you, Brother Russ. If you notice, there's a very thin plastic coating that covers the sacrament of the bread. If you will, go ahead and open that up. It can sometimes be challenging to get into. I'll just say that. The Word of God tells us in 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, For as I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night which He was betrayed, it says He took bread. And when He had given thanks, it says that He broke it. And said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Now we sing songs to celebrate our freedom in America, to celebrate the blessings of God upon this nation. But let us never forget that that liberty of our soul comes from Christ. Lord, I thank you today for your blessings. I thank you for your body that was broken for me. God, I am unworthy so often. But by your grace, I am saved by grace. That your Holy Spirit move upon the hearts. For you told us, Lord, to examine ourselves. You warned us not to partake unworthily. For I pray your Holy Spirit begin to speak to every heart even now. Lord, reveal to us, Lord, sin in our lives. Lord, that known or maybe even unknown. And we ask God for your grace this morning. For you told us, Lord, not to abstain from taking, but examine ourselves and then take. So it's your goal to allow that grace to flow even now in our lives. We're asking this now in the precious name of Jesus. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Cleanse me, Lord. A new, a fresh. In your name I ask it. Amen. Holding that between your fingers, breaking it as a symbol of the broken body of Christ. Take and eat. The same matter also since he took the cup. It says, this cup is the New Testament. In my blood, this do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death Till he come. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for that blood that was shed on Calvary for us. For Lord, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. That doing away with that correction in our life. But the blood was shed at Calvary. And it still flows as strong today as it ever did. Lord, bless this, Lord God. We give you thanks for it. In Christ's name. And everybody said amen. amen. Take and drink. Glory, glory, glory. Glory, glory. You unravel me with a melody. 
lift your hands towards heaven this morning. Give him praise. Give him glory in the house this morning. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Glory, 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 glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. Come live in me, Lord. Live in me. Breathe in me, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, can somebody say praise the Lord this morning? Oh, praise God, praise God. Glory, glory. Thank you, singers. Thank you. Glory. Our, get right into the Word of God this morning. If God would allow us this morning, I, I sound okay to y'all this morning. Praise the Lord. Uh, in, in Ezekiel, the 38th chapter, I'm going to share a lot of scripture this morning. I won't read all of it because there's so much scripture, but I'm going to share a lot of scripture. And I'll go ahead and tell you, the notes that I handed out as you came in, they're not an outline. They are notes that you can take home with you to help you in your studies and follow up with this. But opening up in the first verse, he says that, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against God and the land of Magog, the prince of Rush, Meshach, and Tubal. And prophesy against him. And say thus says the Lord God. Behold I am against you O God. The prince of Rosh. Meshach and Tubal. And I'll turn you around. Put hooks into your jaws. And lead you out with all your army. Horses and horsemen. All splendidly clothed. A great company with bucklers and shields. And all of them handling swords. Verse 5 says, Persia, Ethiopia, Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all his troops, the house of Tobah, from the far north and all his troops, many people are with you. Jump on down to verse 10. Thus says the Lord God, on that day it shall come to pass that Thoughts will arise in your mind and you will make an evil plan and you will say I'll go up against the land of unwalled villages I'll go to a peaceful people who dwell safely all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates to take plunder and to take booty now that's not the shake 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 kind <laughs> come on it's money Splendor is, you know, today's culture, you got to clarify some of those things. It goes on to say to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited and against the people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the midst of the land and Sheba, Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish and all their young lions, everybody say young lions, young lions, will say to you, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your armies to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, take away livestock and goods, to take great plunder? Jump on down to verse 18. And it will come to pass at the same time that when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath, I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. So that the fish of the sea, and the birds of the heavens, and the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. Amen. The mountain shall be thrown down, it says. The steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. Verse 21, I will call for a sword against God 
throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I'll bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed, and I'll rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rains, great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Amen. And everybody said amen. amen. These scriptures, prophetic in nature, you got to understand, church, as he's writing here the mid-6th century B.C., but he's looking forward to our day and all of these things is beginning to transpire in the scriptures many have already even occurred and, but yet there are things that are occurring in our lifetime that we are seeing right before our eyes in the last 13 chapters of, of Ezekiel it can be divided into three sections the first section in Chapter 36 and 37, Ezekiel prophesied about the reestablishment of the state of Israel that we talked about in the last couple of weeks in 1948 uh, where Israel again became a nation. Uh, and then the book of Ezekiel, chapter 40 through 48, the kingdom age otherwise known as the millennial reign is what takes place. But in chapters 38 and 39, it deals with Ezekiel's war. Everybody say Ezekiel's war. But I want you to understand something this morning as, as I begin to look at the studies and the things that I saw in the scripture to see. I believe that it leads up to church. The thought of something that God speaks to us. The battle. Of Ezekiel's prophesying about nations that will converge or what God's response will be in those nations that converge on a climatic, everybody say climatic. climatic. Might I say everything that's leading up to most people understand that there's that big battle that's going to happen, that, that battle. But when is it going to happen, church? We need to understand something. Ezekiel we don't know, church, what he's talking about in the timeline that leads up to that battle of Armageddon. But I believe, church, we begin to see that everything begins to unfold leading to that climatic battle of all battles. you got to understand something, church. We talk about Armageddon and most folks think about Ben Affleck in the movie going to drill it in a meteor somewhere. It's a battle of all battles that God tells us everything is going to come together. Everything is going to come to a head. But church, uh, I know that maybe if you visit with us or maybe you invited family and friends here, you're thinking, well, bless the Lord. It's all going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> but I want you to leave here today to understand something. That you and I stand on the side of the Lord that everything's going to be all right. Amen. Come on, somebody. That you and I need to understand the Word of God. It gives us hope in the midst of it all. It gives us hope to understand that God is with us. We don't need to leave here as Chicken Little, that little children's story that told us about the, the, the chicken that had the Something not an acorn falls on his head and he goes around step yelling to everybody that the, the sky's falling, the sky's falling, the sky's falling. Uh, let me tell you this morning, church, uh, there's Christians that get that kind of a spirit uh, and I don't believe we're winning any souls for it. Uh, but you and I need to understand something this morning in the midst of it all. He is the hope uh, above all hope. Uh, Jesus Christ uh, in the midst of whatever takes place. Jesus and his return earned is the blessed hope of the church. Can I get an amen this morning? Amen. You and I need to understand John 14 said let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so I would have told you. I go to prepare a place, prepare a place to prepare a place for you. That's God 
God's promise. We need to understand this morning that no matter what we're faced with, no matter what we got to listen, church, He's gone back to heaven to prepare a place for each and every one of us that put our trust in Him. He says, I'll come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also, church. So, church, you got to understand in His parting words before He ascended, it is to remember He's coming again. Don't be troubled. Don't be afraid. Don't be anxious. Listen, Jesus is coming to rescue us. Can I give a praise to Him this morning? Come on. Put your hands together this morning. We need to give God the glory to know, church, that the hope that we have is in Christ. Ezekiel, in chapter 38, he's beginning to lead up here to let us know that there's a confederation of nations that will join together and converge against Israel. Everybody say against Israel. You got to understand something this morning, church. A, a little tiny nation that's barely bigger than some of our largest states in the United States of America. But yet it takes forefront in everyday news around the world. But here, church, uh, Ezekiel is sharing with us uh, their target is Israel. Uh, now, that's a specific target, but the target, a broader target, is the God of Israel. Can I get an amen this morning? We need to understand something, church, uh, that anti Semitic. Anti Semitic. Yeah. <laughs> Spit that one out. Is a demonic spirit. I said it's demonic. I didn't drink enough coffee this morning. <laughs> but the demonic powers, you got to understand what's coming and arising in the midst of it all is, is the satanic spirit that comes against Israel and the God of Israel. And church, listen. I say this to understand in the midst of it all. It, it, it's it, to think of, of the military campaign, the confederation of nations uh, is none other than Russia. Come on, somebody. Russia. I don't say that to, to just be uh, fanciful and, and to be modern because of everything that's been in the news the last few years. But I want you to understand something. I believe the scripture begins to give us understanding. Uh, There's actually specifically naming them, church, uh, here in the principal player of this military campaign that's going to happen against the nation of Israel. It's significant because the second most significant player in in this military campaign is Iran. Come on, somebody. Iran. Everybody say Iran. Iran. We see this in chapter 38, church. It, it, it's it, the news that begins to unfold almost like reading the afternoon news journal, church. It's significant terms of, of, of understanding, church, that the alliance between Russia and Iran that there is today is significant for us to see, church, leading in to the headlines of this alliance. Other nations will join them, but this is the lead alliance, church. All of this, he says in verse 1, says, now the the word of the Lord came to me saying son of man set your face against God. Everybody say God. God. You want to circle that word God in your Bible. And out on the margin of your Bible you want to write title. I know this may be contrary to a lot of Bible prophecy but I believe church that God is, is speaking of an individual here. What I mean by that church is God says in verse 2 Prophesy against him. Yeah. Understand, church, I believe that God is a, a personal pronoun that God's telling us of an individual. God, literally a title, or like czar or prince. Think for a moment, church, uh, as one that leads a president, uh, a leader of a nation. Uh, and everybody say, may God. Yeah. Or to circle that word in your Bible, may God. May God first and foremost is the name of one of Noah's grandsons. 
So we find this church as throughout history, major historians, Josephus, Pliny, and Herodotus, all say the ancient land of Magog is an ancient land north of the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea. There's great unity in the character of Magog being Russia, leading that military force in the campaign against Israel, joining in this five other nations. None other than the second most prominent mentioned in the news today is Iran. All of this church, Iran listed here by its ancient name Persia. Verse 5 there you see Persia, Ethiopia, Libya. So the primary country joining Russia, Persia. Did you know up until the late 1935 that Iran was known as Persia? That's not a hard guess, church. To come to this to understand, prior to 1979, that, that they were an ally, an ally church. But upon the Islamic Revolution of 1979, you may know reading in the history books or some, many of you were around at that revolution that led to the hostage situation in Iran. All of these churches during Carter and Reagan and everything that happened. But now, church, as a result, they're not an ally. They are hostile adversaries. And in the Middle East church region, in the Far East region, they need to be recognized as such. And today, church, we're seeing a Russian-Iranian alliance that has never existed before as it does today. We're seeing biblical prophecy fulfilled right before our eyes every day church russia recently read one article that talked about how it recently delivered its advanced s-300 missile defense system to iran after years of debate over the purchase of the warnings from the united states but nevertheless it happened russia and iran negotiated a 10 billion dollar arms deal now we can go ahead and get into some political debate about recent treaty that was arisen about Iran and the plane of money and whatever, but I want you to understand something, church. I believe everything's falling together for the fulfillment of Scripture. Yeah. However you be on the pros, the cons, or wherever you may stand, I, do, I believe to, to get out of that treaty was a good thing. I believe that that, but I also believe uh, that there were adverse consequences uh, that in the fact of it all, that Russia stood there with open arms uh, and Iran ran right into them for a great big hug. Uh, come on, somebody. You and I need to understand in the midst of it all, church, uh, according to Alexa Pushkov, a member of the upper house of Russia, legislature, close ally of President Vladimir Putin. Russia and Iran have created, quote, a durable alliance. He describes Russia, Iran relations as, quote, a partnership which can evolve into a strategic relationship. And so it happens. Amen. All of this church falling into the place a place of God fulfillment of scripture a little place to understand something church all of these are falling into God's prophecy you and I can think we can talk to we're blue in the face but might I say so shall it be I don't believe we need to roll over and and not do. I don't believe that we need we need to understand. That yes, there's going to be a great falling away, but you and I need to save every soul, to lead them to Jesus Christ, not give up and say, well, it doesn't matter what we're going to do, but yes, it does. I said, yes, it does, church. I understand the midst of it all. In, in 2019, at the end of June, Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, called a trilateral summit in Jerusalem with Russia, Israel, and the United States trying to coax Russia away from Iran. It was not successful. Come on, somebody. But in the middle of this trilateral summit, Prime Minister Netanyahu said, I quote, Israel 
will not allow Iran, which calls for our destruction, to establish itself on our border and will do all that we can to prevent it from getting a nuclear weapon. And will, they will, my friend, listen to me this morning, they will, they will take military action, they may go solo on it, but church, let me tell you, God is on their side. Yes. Amen. You got to understand, church, this is all kind of coming to a head. I said it's all coming to a head. We're seeing some of this all beginning to arrange itself in a way that aligns with biblical prophecy in the daily news. I'm always cautious to say, church, that this is exactly what it is because church, let me go ahead and tell you something. We don't ever know exactly what it is. We know what the Word of God tells us. We know that God says there's going to be that battle of Ezekiel 38. We know that it's all going to come to a climatic battle, what we call the battle of Armageddon. We understand all this, but I want you to know, church, during World War II, the church was convinced that Hitler was the Antichrist, that Mussolini was a false prophet. All this church uh, we find throughout history that, that leaders have made the mistake of, of stating this is what it is uh, but I want you to understand something church uh, always keep your eyes stayed upon the Lord and his word always trust we see Ethiopia according to the United States Department is 45% Sunni Muslim Northern Sudan is 70% Sunni Muslim and it also is joined Ethiopia is Libya or some Bibles use the ancient Hebrew put which is 97% Sunni Muslim let me go ahead and tell you Muslim hates Christians Christians don't hate Muslims. Now you get quiet on me right here. Come on. You and I need to love the sinner, not the sin. Come on. I said we need to love the sinner, not the sin. And reach out. That's why that we try to share the love of Christ wherever we may go, church. But I see in the midst of all of this, in the biblical prophecy, it's lining up to bring it to a place, church. All of this to come to a head. In other words, church, all of this represents the Islamic state of the upper now region of Africa. And they will converge against Israel, joining them. In verse 6, it says, Gomer and to Gomer. It tells us, church, these that hearken back to the, the place to understand prophecy representing Eastern Europe. We're talking about Germany and Poland. To Gomer is modern day Turkey. The area also that would include Armenia, Georgia. So these nations converge. This Russian Iranian alliance church is going to be joined by Ethiopia, Northern Sudan, these countries that I list here. But then in verse 13, there's the same chapter. There'll be a few nations that question them. Like, what are you doing and why are you coming against Israel? Come on. Let me tell you something, church. God begins to show this among this list. It says, Sheba to Dan. Everybody say Sheba. To Dan. Now Sheba and to Dan always go together. Always in the scripture. They're referring to what we know as modern day Saudi Arabia. Everybody say Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is going to rise up and say, why are you guys converging against Israel? It's very interesting, you know, it's, it's, what's their stake in this? What's, what is the, the situation that, that they would actually question them and question this is Tarsus Church? Uh, now, church, where exactly is Tarsus located? Uh, historians, uh, Her Herodias, uh, historians said that Tarsus was located beyond the pillars of Hercules. Uh, one of the pillars of Hercules, what are the pillars of Hercules? Uh, it's that rock formation that forms the entrance to the Mediterranean Sea. It's otherwise known as the Straits of Gibraltar. Uh, historian Herodotus says that Tarsus was out of the Mediterranean.
Mediterranean Sea into the Atlantic. Most Bible scholars believe, church, Tarsus is a reference to England. And in addition, church, to England is joining Saudi Arabia, also mentioned in verse 13, the merchants, the merchants of Tarsus and all of her young lions. Now think about that for a moment. What is that nation symbol of England? One of them is a lion. There's actually three, but one of them is a lion. But here at church, the young lions of Tarshish could be, I should repeat, could be, everybody say it could be, a reference to the British territories. Because we don't know. But one thing, church, it may be a veiled reference to the United States of America. Come on, somebody. Because, see, we were a British colony before the American Revolution. All of this church, in other words, there's no mention of the United States. Now, I've heard the mention of the eagles and, and, and we may get into that in a few weeks but I want you to understand your church uh, that we begin to see what the scripture says have you ever wondered where does the United States fall in biblical prophecy we're not really mentioned I said we're not really mentioned but church this may be the only veil reference uh, and it might be because uh, some scholars believe that all of these events begin to transpire right around the time of the rapture of the church we opened the series in Revelations 4 and 1 speaking about the rapture last week we talked about those things that, that had fulfilled in the rapture of the church and what was, was continuing to unfold but think for a moment church when the church Christians and primarily the United States of America is a Judeo-Christian nation. A survey was done by Barnum Studies in 2017 that said 30% of Americans confess to be born again children of God. 30% church were looking at the population of America today is 330 million people. What's to say that a third of this nation is removed at the call of the trumpet of the sound? What about the fact, church, that those children that are beyond the age of, or below the age of accountability? So we're looking, church, at I would estimate 130 to 140 million Americans could be raptured out in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Yeah. Say, now, preacher, you're talking science fiction here. No, I'm talking scripture. Yeah. Where do you think that the judicial system in America will be when 100 million people are gone? Where do you think, church, that the legislature, the government leadership of this nation will be with 100 million people gone? America may not be a superpower. Let that sink in for a moment. America may not be that prominent power that is on the scene when all of this begins to unfold, church. Can you imagine all of this, the missing players that have taken place in this campaign, church? Who really knows? There's no mention of Egypt, church. No mention of Jordan. There's no mention of Syria, church. This might be because in 1979, Egypt is at peace treaty with Israel. And in fact, when Egypt enters into that peace treaty with Israel, it says the Arab League of Nations kicked them out. Ten years later, in 1989, Egypt has maintained that and brought back in. But they were maintained that accord in relation with Israel. 
Jordan in the same way. In 1994, Jordan enters into a peace treaty with Israel. Could it be, church, for those reasons uh, that those are not mentioned here as forces against Israel? Syria, in fact, church, uh, may in fact be out of the picture because it has been rendered helpless and useless. Isaiah 17 and 1, again, verse 4. God speaks of that Damascus prophesying, Isaiah prophesied that day that Damascus will be a heap of ruins. Even today, Syria has almost been rendered helpless except for the Russian and Iranian soldiers that are there. Come on, somebody. Again, everything lining up church See, we begin to think about the battle of Ezekiel. We begin to think about the battle of Armageddon. And we think all of these things, church, it's, it's going to happen. All of a sudden, a bomb's going to be dropped. A, a war's going to be in place. But I want you to know something, church. All of this begins to boil up. All of it begins to unfold to understand something, church. Look down in verse 18. It will come to some... The same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face, in my jealousy, the fire of my wrath. Everybody say wrath. wrath. See, I want to draw you to understand something that I believe that God is showing us here, church. No one will come to Israel's defense. None. No nation. But there'll be one that will. Yes. Psalms 121 and 4 says that indeed he who watches over Israel neither slumber nor sleeps. Come on. Amen. The truth is Israel doesn't need any nations to come to his help. Right. You and I need to understand that foremost and above all church because God is her defense. <laughs> The Lord is her defense and the Lord will rise up and defend his nation and his name for his glory. Never, never forget that church. I, you, you and I, church, need to understand whose side you're going to be on. Come on. Remember we started this out. He says, any nation that curses Israel, I'll curse you. Any nation that bless, blesses Israel, I'll bless you. That's God speaking to us. But it goes on, church, and he says, I've spoken surely in that day that there should be a great earthquake. Everybody say great earthquake. Great. You go on down a few verses. He, he says that the, at my presence, he says on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. Yep. All men, every creeping thing, he says, and the mountains shall be thrown down. Everybody say the mountains shall be thrown down. It says, and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against God throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man sword will be against his brother and I'll bring him to judgment with pestilence. Everybody say pestilence. Underline that church to understand something this morning. In the midst, he said, I should rain down on him, on his troops, and all the many people that are with him. Flooding rains, great hailstones. Everybody say, Great hailstones. Now go over to Revelation, the 16th chapter, for a moment. Revelation 16 and verse 16, it says, He gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. I'm almost done here, church. I want you to see, though, a comparison that Ezekiel 38 and Revelation 16. This again, church, is the only place the word Armageddon is mentioned in all of Scripture. The verses leading up to it, church, tell us that kings from the east will also come and join forces with the nations mentioned in Ezekiel 38 to come against Israel. But church, I want you to understand something. I, I believe the kings of the east, uh, church, 
who is in the east. Everything that we see, church, everything that unfolds, he's always talking in reference to Israel. Always, when you look at Israel, look to the east, church. Revelation 16 and 12 says, the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its waters was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Church, this is where the vast hordes of the communist nation of China enter into a prophetic church that God has spoken of. The end times church. Uh, listen to me this morning. It says church Isaiah. In Isaiah the day of the Lord is written about in Isaiah 11 and 11 and 11 and 15 it says that God will cause the mighty river to shrink down to seven channels. Now numbers are always significant in God and I'm not one to tell you that I am perfect on numbers. But we know, church, that numbers typically represents perfection or completion. In seven days, seven days, God had completed his work and he took rest. Church, you and I need to understand the way prepared God saw to it that the great river Euphrates dried up so that the vast armies of the east could cross over on foot. Come on, somebody. God is a sovereign God. Never forget that, church. In the midst of everything around us, everything taking place, the kings from the east, China, Japan, Korea, talking about Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, the whole Pacific Rim church uh, going to join forces with these other nations uh, and they'll converge uh, against Israel, against God church. Uh, some Bible scholars interpret the, the war of Ezekiel and the war of Revelation 16 as two distinct wars. Uh, but I believe church uh, that instead when you notice the similarities uh, between Revelation 16 and what I just read at Ezekiel 38 that in fact church what actually ends up happening is these two forces begin to merge understand church all these nations mentioned in Ezekiel 38 at the beginning of the tribulation but they wage a campaign against Israel and it culminates with this battle of Armageddon. All of this church, notice the similarities. It says in verse 16, he gathered them together, place called Armageddon. Verse 17 says, the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. There came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. There were voices and thunders and lightnings. There was a great earthquake. Everybody said great earthquake. Such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. Notice the similarity, church. A great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake has not occurred since men were on the earth. It says in verse 19, that great cities divided into three parts of the city of the nations fell. Great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of wine, the fierceness of his wrath. Another word, church, in verse 38. Understand, verse 20. Every island fled away. Come on, the mountains were not found, church. Ezekiel 38. There fell upon men great hell out of heaven again. Ezekiel 38. Every stone about the weight of a talent. Listen to the church. Do you know how much a talent is? Almost a hundred pounds. That's going to do some damage. I said, that's going to do some damage. Only God. I said, only God, church. But would men cry out to God for mercy and grace? Read headlines of the news this morning complaining of it. Some actor had talked about great calamity would have to come to this nation or this world before anything's going to change. And people begin to mock him and say, have we not seen tsunamis and plagues and not seen things? 
But the scripture says that no matter what happens, it says they will not repent. What about us? Where are we in our heart this morning? Are we ever going to seek the face of God? In Revelations 19 and 11, church, John writes, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in his righteousness he doth judge and make war. All of this church, all of this unfolding, it says in verse 12 that his eyes is flame with fire. On his head were many crowns, and he had a name written, church, that no man knew but he himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. All of this begins to unfold, church. Revelations and Ezekiel. You look over because you see here the Lord returns and he strikes down these nations that have come against him and come against Israel. This is all coming to a climax and the church coming with him. Come on, somebody. He'll return. He's going to put an end to this battle. He's going to display his power and his glory all to see church. This is how Ezekiel 38 ends. This is how Revelation begins to unfold. Look again in verse 23 of Ezekiel 38. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself and I'll be known in the eyes of many nations. And they shall know that I am the Lord. Can I get an amen this morning? Amen. You and I need to understand, church, God's ultimate purpose is to reveal Himself and in a serious manner, He will get their attention. You might think to yourself, well, that's an odd way for God to get people to know Him. But let me go ahead and tell you, when nations are full throttle in opposition to God, God has to display His power in a way greater than theirs. Yeah. Come on. I say greater than theirs. Greater than the opposition against Him. It's like this, church. The harder that you hit your head against a brick wall, the more it hurts. It's the same way with God. The harder you oppose Him, the more it hurts. All of this being fulfilled. God will display Himself in all His power, all His glory, so that people might know Him. Amen. Frankly, church, the way I see it, in the timeline of events that unfold prophetically, I don't see us here for the battle of Armageddon. No. Come on. I said, I do not see Christians here for the battle of Armageddon. When you look at the timeline of events, church, I see the church is raptured before this climatic battle. And church, only God knows what's happened before in the building up to this battle. I said, church, I believe we're going to be kept safely in heaven. And we're going to be the ones that are clothed in white and are returning with the Lord in that great battle. Come on. I believe we're going to fight church for His glory on His behalf. Amen. By the power of His breath that says He'll overthrow the armies that oppose Him. Amen. But we return with Him, church, because we've been kept safely in heaven after the rapture or when we die knowing Christ, we've already gone to heaven. Amen. The final deal here, church, I said the final deal here is not about being afraid or worried. To understand church, it's about being ready. It's about being prepared. If I leave us with these words, church, Jesus says, He reminds us when you see all of these things begin to happen. Luke 21 and 28. He says, when you see all of these things begin to happen, Look up. Lift up your heads. Because your redemption draws near. Are we ready? I said, are we ready? That's the question, church. Am I right with the Lord? Am I 
ready? That's the question that each and every one of us need to be asking ourselves this morning. Am I ready? Church, there is no fear that we don't have to worry about what's going to happen. But listen, we need to know this. The world is getting crazy. It's getting crazier still, crazier still. And Jesus is coming. I said Jesus is going to come and we're going to be with him forever. When he returns again, church, he's going to establish his kingdom on earth for a thousand years. It's what we call the millennial reign of Christ. All of this church to be right with him. Then you don't have to be afraid of what's to come. We can rest in the Lord Jesus Christ and know everything's going to be all right. Amen. Would you bow your heads this morning? All over this church, would you bow your heads? Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit begin to speak to the hearts and the lives of each and every one that's here. Lord, I pray that you begin to touch, Lord, each one, every man, woman, and child here today. Lord, that we know, that we know, that we know that we put our trust in you, that everything's going to be all right. Everything is going to be all right. If you're here this morning and say, Pastor, I don't know, but I want to know now. I want to know. Come on, saints of God, pray. Would you this morning let this pastor Would you let this pastor pray with you? Would you do that? I believe God's speaking to hearts. I believe God's speaking to you this morning. Would you pray this prayer with me? Dear Lord, I'm a sinner. tried it my way but today I'm sorry I confess I'm a sinner forgive me Lord I believe you died for my sins that I might be saved cleanse me Lord from all unrighteousness do work in me. Jesus, I pray. If you prayed that prayer, God's heard that prayer. It's simple as that. In your heart, you're sorry. And you ask Him, His love, His love reaches down where you are right now to lift you up. You don't have to struggle. You don't have to fret about it. You just trust. Trust in Jesus. Trust in His grace. Trust in His love. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever is talking about you and I, whosoever that's talking about you today, do you trust Him? Do you trust the Lord? If you prayed that prayer, would you let this preacher know it? Just while I say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer. Let me see your hand this morning. We want to rejoice with you. We want to rejoice with you and pray that God bless you richly. Glory. Stand to your feet this morning all over the sanctuary. Glory. Glory. Joshua, lead him in this chorus. He knows my name, Jesus. He knows my every thought. He says the Lord we serve this morning.
other call. Lord God, we come today. Lord, at the close of this service this morning, I thank you. God, as we read about, Lord, the terrible things of this world that are going on in the midst of it all, Lord God, you've shared with us that there is hope. There is hope in Jesus Christ that no matter what comes, no matter what we face, Lord God, that you are there with us. God, that we put our trust in you. Lord God, that, that you will keep us safe. You will carry us through. Lord God, I pray today, Lord, that you instill in the hearts of this people to share with their loved ones, share with their family. Lord God, that we all must be prepared. Must get ready. We must get ready for your return. Jesus, we pray in your precious name that your blessings will flow from your throne upon this people. And everybody said amen and amen. God bless you and God love you on this 4th of July today. God love you so much.